My next guest is Sharon Horgan. She's a brilliant writer and actor. She co-created and stars in the TV show Catastrophe. Catastrophe is sort of a different kind of romance. It's a British TV show. It runs on Amazon here in the States. It's about a slightly lost school teacher and a slightly dopey American ad guy who hook up in London. They think it's basically just a particularly memorable one-night stand until they realize she's pregnant. Then, eventually, they fall in love. It's a slightly hokey premise, told without an ounce of hokiness. It's gross and rough and scary. The characters aren't anti-heroes. They're just human beings who mess up sometimes, sometimes a lot. And the show is really, really funny. I talked to Sharon in 2016, right as the second season of Catastrophe was taking off. It's now on its fourth season, which will hit TVs across the United States soon. Sharon co-created the show with Rob Delaney, who's also her co-star. Here's a scene from Catastrophe's second season. At this point, the two stars are married. Two kids, whole new set of problems. Horgan's character has been staying home with the baby. She basically doesn't know anyone except the people from her mommy group, almost all of whom she hates. There's only one with whom she bonds. They sort of bond in class, but when Sharon tries to make friends with her outside of class, she ends up getting the cold shoulder. So anyway, Rob comes home from work one day, and Sharon wants to vent to him. I got dumped today by my mum friend, Samantha. She doesn't want to see me anymore. I couldn't even hang on to a mum friend. And it's not like she's all that. It's not like she's Beyonce. She said I should go and hang out with the mombies, and you know what? She's right. Every single one of those mums is probably more interesting than me. Rob. What? What I just said. You're not going to say anything. Do you not care? Right now, I don't know that I do care about that. I mean, we've got two kids under the age of three. My job is a nightmare, and those things use up all my daily care units. So sometimes, when you need attention at the end of the day, I got nothing left for you. And, I, you know, I know that's not fair, but what do I do? You dig deep and you scrounge something up for me. Don't be lazy. What do you want me to say? Say she sounds like a She does sound like a I'll kill her for you. Do you know how happy that would make me? I got plenty of hate units left. <laughs> It's really weird hearing that without the visual and hearing Rob make the kind of noise, I can't even do it, <laughs> and not see his face. It was this weird kind of dislocated sound. Rob does, I mean, one of the interesting things to me about Rob Delaney's new career as a British comedian and actor, <laughs> um, he now lives in London, having moved from here in Los Angeles, is that Rob is like a parody of an American person. <laughs> like Fred in Willard real, or in something. In real life. Well, like, yeah. No, I mean, just he just is like, uh, he has, he's very handsome in a very sort of s smiling and genial way. And he just has a kind of like, hello quality to him. We just fall for that. <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. I mean, he's he's charming the English ladies all over the place. They can't get enough of him. He's sort of like, he actually sort of reminds me of like when a British comedian is doing an American guy. And he's like, oh, how are you? Would you like a casserole? <laughs> but that's how he is in real life. I mean, yeah. that's how he, he operates. <laughs> He's, you know, he's is very specific <laughs> individual, um, but that's what's so funny about him. Now you had had uh, you've had a, a long television career in the UK. Uh, you created a show called Pulling, which was very deeply beloved. But Rob, until I don't know, four years ago, maybe three, four years ago, uh, wasn't even working full time in comedy. Yeah, I know. When the two of you started talking about creating a show, was it always going to be a uh, romance? Oh, no. Oh, God, no. Um, we didn't even, uh, really truthfully, we didn't realize it was um, a romance or a romantic comedy or whatever you call it until we were screening it. We had a screening <laughs> at, uh, at BAFTA and we showed um, the first two episodes and then we were brought up on stage, you know, to have the chat and uh, the lady who was interviewing us described it as a romantic comedy and we were like oh really oh all right then um we definitely never set out to do that 
we just wanted to explore a, a long term relationship and and how you know sometimes it's just easier to stay together than go through the my of you know having to part. And um, sorry, are you allowed to swear? No, not at all. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just that it would be. <laughs> Honestly, I'm I'm more upset by your idea that uh, probably a good premise for a television show is sometimes it's easier just to not break up. <laughs> That I'm was... Now I'm questioning my my own happy marriage. <laughs> well, you know <laughs> it's you was... know it's true, um, and in fact that was almost our in, entire pitch um, for the show. And and way way back in the beginning when we were writing down ideas, we we had this sort of ridiculous idea that um, they would spend a lot of time talking about the weighing up the pros and cons. Like maybe in every episode we'd see them list the reasons why they should stay together and why they should part, and you know go and favor of the staying together thank god we didn't do that because that's a terrible um, idea but the essence of that was kind of in there and I think the reason why it sort of ended up being a romantic comedy is because we ended up spending the first series focusing on them kind of getting together and them falling in love while she becomes more and more pregnant and and I another reason why it became romantic comedy is that I, for some reason we're kind of <laughs> good together on screen you know that it's sort of uh there's an inherent kind of i don't know sort of sweetness there thank god because the material is quite tough you know and i think uh that helps sort of um balance it a bit you know so i, I want to ask you a question about tone one of the things that's interesting to me about catastrophe is that as brutal and unpleasant and unsparing as the tone is, as much as it's about the problems of relationships and parenting, it's not about these two characters being jerks. Like, not that they're perfect or anything, but, like, the premise isn't what happens when two jerks are so lovable that you just got to love them. And I imagine that must have, to some extent, been a choice, to let them be, like, people just doing their best. Yeah, I I also think it's hard to make certainly a comedy. Well, it's harder to make a comedy when you have a proper anti-hero as as the main character, and when you have an unlikable um, person. I I think you know you can have flawed characters, of course, and um, it works in that works in drama and in comedy. But um, I think all we wanted to do was to make them like you or me. Well, not you. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I am a real antihero. <laughs> um, we just we wanted to give them flaws and we wanted them to, you know, have hang ups and be selfish and all of those things. But for me, it was exciting. I mean, going back to what you were saying earlier, that there was a, a, a male character who was allowed to be a nice guy who at times under duress very happy to be a jerk. So, um, <laughs> well, he, and, has, he has this kind of he has this kind of heedless quality that you heard in that clip, like this that it also registers as very American to me. Which is when he says, "I can work anywhere in advertising in Boston." <laughs> and he doesn't even say it out of self regard. It's just this kind of blind acceptance that, as a white American dude, he's just king of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's you know nothing to be proud of though, is it? <laughs> um, but and I think um, with Sharon's character, it, it's um, I think she has uh, she's much more of a jerk than him, or at least um, is doesn't care if um, people think she's a jerk. You know, she's she's um, that that was fun to write and sort of. Because I think I've kind of become a bit more like that <laughs> over the years. Um, I used to care so much <laughs> about what what people think of me, and and you know you just kind of get old and gnarly, and you stop um, you stop worrying about all that. And it was nice to put that sort of into um, a, a female character where she's just like, "This is who I am, and what you see is what you get," kind of thing. I want to ask you a question about uh, making this show. So, like a a couple of years ago. Uh, friend of mine from a high school got cast in romantic sex comedy on cable television. What's it called? It's called You're the Worst. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's a great show. But uh, I watched it and I was like, oh, my God, this sex scene is intense and crazy and brutal. Uh, it's not, like, dark <laughs> at all. Well, it's a little bit dark. But, like, it's just... What happens? Sex... They... 
just all kinds of stuff. Right. A broad variety of things. There's no nudity, but oh. all other things happen. Right, right. And the only other show that I've seen that has that feeling in the sex scenes is Catastrophe. That it is, it's kind of like mad, flailing, gross, <laughs> but also fun and sexy. You are there. <laughs> Stop pointing at me. <laughs> my, you and Rob are there <laughs> banging into each other. <laughs> what is that like? Um, okay. So it's, um, I think the really hard thing was writing that stuff um, because you're writing with your pal, you're sitting by your pal, you are just writing comedy <laughs> and suddenly you realise you've written a really <laughs> graphic kind of revolting sex scene that you're going to have to perform with the uh, married father of three that's sitting um, beside you. So the, the 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 tricky thing about that was if we, if we ever stopped to think about it, we kind of froze because it felt wrong. So um, once we got over that, it was fine. And then I would say that um, the first time we had to snog, you know, the first kiss was the worst because I think he was so terrified of, um, I don't think he, he hadn't done any screen kissing. Um, I'd done my fair share of screen kissing. Um, I think he was, you know, he wanted to be a gentleman and um, he was like, definitely, I am not going to get any tongue or saliva near this woman. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was like, um, you know, it was it was the most un, unsexy, un kind of um, anything um, uh, kiss you've you've ever experienced. So but once we got that out of the way. All the sort of vile sex acts we did post that were fun because it was uh, it was just um, how can we make this funny and how can we you know make this look um, like real sex and not you know TV sex because no one has sex like that and people don't look beautiful when they have sex they look ugly and they make stupid faces and they grunt and sometimes they fart and sometimes bad things happen and they sweat and um, so we kind of. We wanted. I'm surprised even that you said that it it was sexy because I can't. Well, it's absurd. I mean, I I I'll disagree with it that the two of you both look beautiful when you're having <laughs> sex on screen. You look fantastic. Um, but there is like there is a quality to it which it's it isn't simply played as gross. Like it would be a different thing if the sole purpose of it felt like it was to be gross and funny. But instead, it is more like reflective of what doing it is like. Yeah. Which is to say, like, it's a goofy thing. Yes. It's dumb, but it's also in some deep part of your brain, the number one most important thing that there is and the number <laughs> one, like, best, most gratifying thing there is. So the, <laughs> it's like the two of those things, it's just you just accept the absurdity of it and the goofiness of it in a very sincere way, which is, I, I think, also just reflective of the way that the show treats uh, Sharon and Rob's relationship. You know, you could all those things that you can say about love, you could you, uh, that you could say about sex, you can also say about love and being in a relationship. Like, it's weird and dumb and ridiculous but also it's the most important thing yeah god that's completely true i think in the first series continuing to talk about the sex the first series we knew we were going to have to have a lot of sex in there because they're just getting to know each other and you know when you get to know someone first the only thing you're interested in is is having sex with them and it's a very specific time and it's a very specific kind of feeling that some people think is falling in love and, and isn't and uh, so we knew we wanted to be as honest as possible about that and show them having enormous amounts of sex and then in the second season we knew that people liked the sex <laughs> and, uh, and watching it. But we were like, oh, no, this is like three years in. People have a lot less sex, especially when you've got, you know, two young kids. And so we had we were sort of torn between like being really honest about, you know, the sex in a, in a, in a long term relationship. Um, so, I mean, in the end, we, we sort of had to sort of straddle this thing where, it was kind of functional, you know, and to sort of um, find the, the, the kind of fun and, and the reality in that. But also I think, you know, by the end of the, 
well, certainly in in the middle of the the second season, you you know that they love each other, but you know that there's um, extreme difficulties there, and there's like wandering eyes, and there's um, you know a whole bunch of reasons why um, it's it's hard for them to sort of continue to be in love. But we also felt like, you know, they're still attracted to each other, you know, and uh, and so therefore people who are attracted to each other have sex. I, I want to ask you a little bit about your own life as a, uh, as a parent and as a married person. When you, uh, when you were married, and I don't know how long you've been married, but when you were married, what part of it did you feel like you, you didn't expect or, or weren't prepared for? Um, I, I don't know if I was prepared for any of it. Because, um, you know, like with the show, I got pregnant very um, quickly um, by accident. And we sort of shotgun married um, because my parents are Catholic. And um, we came home to tell them the great news that we were getting married. And then, oh, and yeah, we're just we're going to have a baby. Sorry. Um, so I think... Um, I I didn't even think about it. I didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a kind of. Uh, I never felt like I wanted to be married. It was never something I sort of was an aim of mine, or it was just a thing that that happened. And um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, can I just don't get too romantic because the audience <laughs> won't buy it. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, what's romantic is that we stayed together, and and I think that's way more romantic and I think what's romantic is that we probably like each other more now than we did when he you know asked me to marry him so I don't know what I expected I I kind of expected to feel a little different and I didn't and then um, I expected it to just motor on (laughs) and what it has become is kind of interesting and and I think what it's become is um, you know sometimes it's terrible and then you think this is um, this couldn't get any worse and then you stick it out you ride it out and then you suddenly go oh my god I can't believe I'm feeling like this about the person I hated two years ago Let's take a listen to a scene from the second season of Catastrophe, starring and co-created by uh, my guest, Sharon Horgan. Um, So basically, they've got a toddler and a new baby, and in order to get all of their new baby visits done at once, they've invited all their friends and family over to the house for the day. It's just been brutal and awful, (laughs) and um, they're, I think, sitting in bed together talking about it. I think it may have been irresponsible for us to procreate. Okay. You're an alcoholic. Your mother's a card-carrying sadist. My dad can't remember my name. Fergal, well, nothing's been diagnosed, but, you know, there's obviously a few things wrong there. It's not looking good. Thank God you're so normal. (laughs) What do you think about what my mother was saying? About loving each other more than the kids? I think there's something wrong with her. Okay, good. I was worried it was just me. I just think, if you don't love the kids more than me, then you're not fit to be a mother. Of course I love them more than you. I'm not a sociopath. I haven't even bonded with my baby, and I still love her more than you. You haven't bonded with the baby? No. Do you think you might have a little postnatal depression? I don't know. No. I don't know. I... This is going to sound awful, but I just worry that I don't love Mirren the way I love Frankie. Is that why you gave her a crazy name? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, just the minute she came out, she scared me. She looked like an alien. Frankie was beautiful. Even the day he was born, he was just this tiny, beautiful little bean. He weighed four pounds. I mean, he was almost dark red, and he had a hairy back. <laughs> he was a monster. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, when I had my second um, baby. That was my experience. Um, she was... Enormous. I mean, she was, <laughs> she looked, she looked four months old. Um, she had the the face of a sumo wrestler. She was monstrous. <laughs> and she was handed to me and I was think, I just thought, oh my God, I'm never going to bond with you. I was lucky because I, like two hours later, she was the love of my life. But it was a weird kind of feeling of, you know, temporary as it was, sort of 
desperation. Well, one of the weird things about working in show business is that the patterns of work are so strange because, you know, I think many to most people uh, go to work and then come home um, with some kind of normalcy, some kind of regularity. And for many people who work in show business, especially film and television, their life is either uh, not working or all-consuming work. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. know, when you're shooting something, you're working often more than 12-hour days. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be working 16-hour days or 18-hour days in some cases even. And you have been working on things that you are on camera for and writing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, (laughs) right now you have a catastrophe on uh, Amazon Prime. You're working on a show for HBO. Uh, Like the all-consumingness of that is must be very difficult. I mean, it's scary. It's very scary, but um, I kind of think uh, there's not much I can do about it. I mean, there's definitely choices that I could have made that would have um, um, freed up my life a bit more. But, uh, you know, I think if, uh, as a writer, especially more than even as an actor, you have to have a few projects on the go because so often the things don't get picked up. And I've had lean periods. I've had, you know a couple of years where, you know, I only made pilots and nothing happened. And so I always, always had um, several projects sort of, you know, ready to go, how about this one? And as it turned out, in the last two years, about three or four things kind of moved at the same time. And, uh, you know, I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis. I can't sort of take a year or two years off between films because no one would give a um, a, <laughs> a proverbial, you know, whatever about me. Um, they'd, and so, and it's my career and it's, um, when it's going well, it genuinely makes me happy and it genuinely stops me from going mental. And so therefore I know I'm, I'm a, a better parent and a better person um, because of it. I would be a nightmare um, if I wasn't working, I, I know that. I thought you were about to say I would be a nightmare if I were Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> I always, would I always would be, making shoes. I would be a great Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would fit him like a glove. Horgan's coming for you, Lewis. <laughs> Only to be you. Wait, is his surname Day Lewis or is his first name Daniel Day? His first name is Daniel Day. That's very nice. Yeah, it's a good name. Do you feel secure now? I mean, I will stipulate that you're notably successful at this point <laughs> in your career and exceptionally good at what you do. But having come to success so late in your life as so a late, real as a real a adult, <laughs> a, a bit late, but as a real adult, not as a no, semi adult. Yeah. Does, do you feel like that makes you feel more secure in uh, the success you've earned or less? Definitely, I don't feel secure in any way. Definitely think that, you know, I still have that crazy thing of like stockpiling um, projects waiting for one or two or more to, to fail. So, but that's not a bad thing. I definitely feel more secure in myself because... You know, there's, um, uh, I don't know, there's a, a confidence that comes with age or, or you know, a belief or whatever. And um, I feel very aware of the fickleness of the industry. And I think that's a very positive thing. I, I don't expect anything from anyone. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm I'm pessimistic, but in, in a healthy way, I think. And uh so I, I don't think I would have those sort of, um, if you want to call them qualities, I don't know if they are flaws, um, if I hadn't sort of started a bit later, because I feel like I've I've been through it all and I've kind of, you know, seen it and I, I know the tricks. If you don't expect much from show business, do you still require something of it? Like, is it still important to you to have the approval and does it still hurt really bad when people disapprove? Which is, I'm presuming that you, like everyone else in all of entertainment, got into entertainment in part to get people to like you. Yeah, Yeah, of course. Uh, Yeah, it still um, really hurts. I mean, if something, you know, um, doesn't go or it doesn't even turn out as I've pictured it in my head, you know, it all um, it all hurts. And I but I don't. I feel like, 
yeah, um, now I still obviously want approval, mainly from just my family. <laughs> but um, but I also feel like I just have a need to do it now, uh, you know, um, because like I said earlier, I, I think I would sort of lose my marbles um, if I didn't do it. And I kind of, you know, but but I think now I'm a little bit spoilt because I got I've had got to make shows that I actually really like and with people I really like and with people that I admire, and so that that does kind of get in the way a bit because then you're like oh, that's all I want to do now I I don't want to do just anything I don't want to just be employed I don't want to be just busy it needs to be something that I care hugely about. Well, Sharon Horgan, thank you so much for taking all this time to be on the show. It was <laughs> okay. really great to get to talk to you. Thank you. It's good to talk to you too. Sharon Horgan. The new season of Catastrophe will be out later this year. Now's a great time to get caught up. If you haven't seen it, you can stream it on Amazon Prime Video. <laughs> 